Welcome to HealthCast, the heartbeat of health IT. I'm your host, Melissa Harris. Today, we continue our line of episodes with leadership from historically Black colleges and universities, or HBCUs, with a special guest from Howard University's College of Medicine. Howard's College of Medicine is the oldest of those at HBCUs in the country, and nearly 150 years since its founding, it's pioneering unique ways to interweave medicine and technology to address pressing health issues in underserved and minority communities. As the school takes a multidisciplinary approach with technology to find solutions across medical access, care, and academics, there is one dean at the school overseeing these efforts. He's our guest today, Michael Crawford, Howard University College of Medicine's Associate Dean for Strategy, Outreach, and Innovation. In our conversation, we'll go into some of the work the school is doing, including its recently launched 1867 Health Innovations Project, as well as other initiatives to foster collaboration across academia, industry, and government to cultivate improved digital health efforts. But before we jump there, we started off just learning a little bit about Howard's Medical School, as well as what it means to be a Dean of Innovation. Michael, thank you so much for joining us on HealthCast today. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. Of course. So I just want to jump right into a little bit about Howard's Medical School. Not all HBCUs have medical schools, so can you start by going into how Howard's College of Medicine is unique from other medical schools in its focus on providing medical care and support for underserved communities? Howard University's College of Medicine is the oldest medical school amongst the HBCUs. Howard University's College of Medicine was founded in 1868 with an emphasis on training African-American and minority physicians, really to close a gap at that particular time, to really contribute to adding high-quality minority physicians to the healthcare ecosystem, to be able to provide opportunities for patients to receive care from individuals that look like them, and also opportunities for African-American and other communities of color physicians to receive educational opportunities to pursue careers in medicine, science, and also in research. So Howard is the oldest medical school, uh, still graduates the highest number of African-American physicians in the country. So we occupy a very unique space, not only amongst HBCUs, but with amongst healthcare uh, medical schools throughout the country and in the globe. And within the College of Medicine, you are the Dean of Innovation. Tell our listeners, what is a Dean of Innovation and why are the digital tools and technologies you're striving to uphold important to Howard? As the Dean of Innovation, uh, my full title is Associate Dean of Strategy, Outreach, and Innovation. And when I think about innovation, I think about the combination of strategy as well as innovation. And the way in which you think about solving problems, framing, and looking at pain points that people are experiencing. So as the Dean of Innovation, I offer a unique perspective in terms of problem solving. So within the College of Medicine, as well as our medical science enterprise, I have the ability to work with a significant number of talented faculty, staff, and students, and have the ability to look at complex healthcare challenges that are not only confronting the College of Medicine from an academic perspective, but also what our ambulatory and inpatient healthcare entities are experiencing. So having a innovative perspective at the table with someone that is solely focused on looking at problems differently, using a patient and data-centric approach to solve these problems, and looking at low-tech and high-tech solutions to be able to augment problem solving as well as framing of problems, I think offers uh, Howard, as well as our entire medical enterprise, a unique perspective in terms of how we want to look at solving problems and researching solutions to solve problems and creating methodologies and processes to be able to test, pilot, and iterate solutions that can solve immediate and long-term problems and then also may scale for maximum impact. Speaking of some of those projects that you're testing and piloting, 
Can you tell our listeners about some of the top priorities and projects that you have in your position? I know that just as some background, you've worked in um, the 1867 Health Innovations Project. So if you want to start there, that'd be great. Sure. This past April, Howard, uh, as well as myself and the Dean of the College of Medicine, established 1867 Health Innovations Project, which is a major priority for the College of Medicine, as well as the medical science enterprise, uh, because it gives us an organized way to be able to partner with entrepreneurs, researchers, corporate partners, and innovators that are interested in tackling complex challenges confronting medically underserved communities. So our program allows us to identify different solutions and technologies, specifically in the areas of artificial intelligence, machine learning, virtual mix and augmented reality, sensors that passively and actively monitor, wearables, mobile apps, and data analytics platforms that we can pair with academic and health models to be able to address endemic healthcare challenges confronting medically underserved individuals, families, and communities, such as diabetes, cancer, hypertension, neurodegenerative disorders, behavioral and mental health challenges, and other chronic diseases that have a disproportionate impact on medically underserved communities. So 1867 allows us to really partner and to identify these solutions to really tackle these challenges for folks that are often overlooked and underrepresented in these innovation discussions. We have a specific focus on looking at solutions, models, and programs that can increase patient experience, affordability, healthcare outcomes, and access to care all of which are challenges for our specific patient population. And we also have a number of students that originate from some of these communities. So our students offer a unique perspective in terms of how we look at leveraging these technologies to be able to address some of these systemic problems that medically underserved communities experience throughout the country, especially in urban and rural environments. That's really fantastic and quite unique for a school to be taking on. So, you know, if other HBCUs are planning to adopt Kickstarter projects like the 1867 Health Innovations Project, how can they do that and, uh, you know, apply it to advance their research and work? As you and I are well aware of, especially during this pandemic, the need for digital solutions has increased substantially. We know that because of the pandemic, schools have moved into a remote posture, meaning that students now need a tablet, a laptop, a desktop, as well as broadband access to be able to engage in their learning, their curriculum, as well as the classroom environment. Similarly, in healthcare, the pandemic has amplified the need for digital solutions. The pandemic moved patients from an inpatient and in-person posture to a outpatient and remote posture simply because patients couldn't access their provider due to COVID-19 and the number of restrictions that were put in place. So the need for programs structured around identifying and testing and validating solutions to be able to help different types of populations, particularly those populations of color and medically underserved, I think are critically important from a research perspective because there's not a lot of research with technology in medically underserved communities that is readily available for individuals to be able to use that information to inform decision-making, programmatic elements within the academic setting, as well as programmatic elements within the outpatient and inpatient setting. So I think that all schools, whether it's your innovation is focused on digital technology, if it's focused on policy, models, different types of models to improve healthcare access as well as outcomes, or even to introduce your students, faculty, and staff to new innovations and solutions from an academic perspective, 
specifically in the areas of artificial intelligence, machine learning, and simulation, and curriculum reform innovation. I think that these types of innovative programs can be a catalyst and be a way that you have a cheerleader and a champion to be able to evangelize these types of causes within your organization. With what we know uh, from organizational development, if you do not have an individual or a specific division or unit or program to be able to evangelize these efforts, sometimes they tend to wane or ebb and they do not actually realize the full potential that they could have within your organization. So I think having someone that is devoted and responsible in a program or program or division or unit that is championing these calls, I think is critically important. And I think every organization, in my opinion, should have a program, business unit, or department that is focused on this type of work. I couldn't agree more. You know, and as Dean of Innovation, you were discussing how we're increasingly moving toward this digital environment for not just academics, but for healthcare as well. So what role do you see these emerging technologies playing in uplifting health outcomes for minority and underserved populations, and also in increasing accessibility to healthcare? One area where we, we really have, have been focused on is this access question. This has really manifested itself during the COVID-19 pandemic when we started to introduce telehealth solutions to our patient population. And correspondingly, we had to think about how we introduce hardware and software and digital solutions for our students, right? So some of our students, as I mentioned, reside in some of these communities and originate from some of these medically underserved communities. So we had to take this parallel approach, and I'll talk about the healthcare aspect first and then transition to the academic component. This past June, we partnered with AARP's Innovation Lab to explore tech and data solutions for 50-plus medically underserved. And through that relationship, AARP opened up their repository of entrepreneurs that they have kind of curated, interviewed, tested through their process and other partners to determine if they were a good fit with their innovation priorities. So talking about fintech as well as healthcare, we, through this relationship, were able to tap in to that portfolio of healthcare companies that they've identified. And most of those companies are, are startup companies. They're pre-series A or series A companies that have a proof of concept, may have some customers, but have not really scaled to the level that merits a series B or a large investment from either venture capital, private equity, or corporate partner. So through that relationship, we interviewed a series of their portfolio companies and identified two companies that aligned with our innovations priorities. One, we wanted to tackle diabetes because diabetes is a large chronic condition that impacts the U.S. substantially, but also disproportionately impacts medically underserved communities. Closely aligned to the diabetes challenges, medication adherence. So we identified a couple technology companies that align with our ambition to tackle the diabetes epidemic, as well as tackle this component of medication adherence. So we established two clinical pilot projects. One was with a robot that has facial recognition, natural language processing, dispenses medication, while the other technology is an online platform that crowdsources individuals with chronic diseases and allows them to benefit from peer support. Our goal through these pilot projects was to determine whether or not these technologies could improve hemoglobin A1C levels, help folks better manage their medication or improve and or improve medication adherence, also evaluate the UX experience, and then look at quality of life factors. So over the course of these pilot projects, the one with the robot, we noticed a significant increase in people's ability to manage their medication, a decrease in individuals' hemoglobin A1C levels, and an ability to improve their quality of life metrics over a 90-day period. 
which was quite remarkable because the population that we identified in this pilot project was digital naive. So this was the first introduction in experience with these types of innovative technologies. And through that exposure, they were able to use this technology to help them better manage their diabetic condition. The other pilot project, which is this online platform, we're still in the middle of that pilot. It has already demonstrated that individuals are improving their overall management of diabetes just by being around individuals that share their condition. They are receiving information to help them better manage their medication adherence, to better manage their diabetes. And within the next several weeks, we'll have that data to be able to share in its entirety. So the introduction of technology, what we have seen through these two pilots is it's already increasing access because it allows the provider to communicate with the patient via the platform or through the device. It also is allowing the provider to manage the medication in real time to determine if the patient is taking those medications consistently and regularly. And if not, a notification can be sent to that patient. Also, we're able to look at what types of questions are being asked in the form or to the robot which helps inform future interventions in real-time interventions to help folks better manage their condition. So we're already seeing technology play a significant role in in increasing access, improving outcomes, as well as the overall dynamic between patient and provider. On the academic side, what we have seen is that attendance for classes has increased dramatically by students being able to participate remotely. And engagement has increased within the classroom environment because now folks are being able to log on to class from the comfort of their own home and be able to engage in a robust dialogue with their colleagues as well as our faculty members. So there are some benefits of technology that post-pandemic on the academic side that we will continue to explore and embrace while we look for other opportunities to enhance the student and faculty experience by leveraging technology. That is super fascinating just hearing about the projects that, or pilots rather, that you've been working on um, in tackling diabetes. And of course, the component with the technology increasing access to academics as well is an important angle. But, you know, focusing on the College of Medicine too, you know, what does the relationship between the students and faculty and the innovation startups you're launching look like? Are they involved and how so? So the diabetes pilot that I just mentioned, the PI on that project is a faculty member in the head of our diabetes treatment center and is a endocrinologist by training. We have also partnered with the School of Pharmacy. So there is a co-PI that is a School of Pharmacy faculty member that has enlisted students to work on the project. So we are leveraging the medical complex and really trying to champion this interdisciplinary approach to delivering care, because we believe that in the future, healthcare will be delivered through this interdisciplinary approach. So we are mirroring that thought process through our clinical pilots and introducing students and giving them opportunities to work with our faculty members on these clinical pilots to one, expose them to the technology, two, have them conceptualize a new approach to being able to treat patients within this new world of healthcare. And then three, exposing them to the academic rigor of research and what does research look like from developing an IRB application and submitting an IRB application then monitor tracking and reporting based on your IRB submission. So we, through these pilots, we're looking at ways where we can not only integrate our medical students into the work that we're doing from a digital health and innovation perspective, but we're also looking at opportunities where we can foster this interdisciplinary approach by leveraging our college of pharmacy, our College of Nursing and Allied Health, our College of Dentistry, and bringing all of the schools together to really usher in a new new way of thinking about how we treat individuals, families, and communities, especially from a population health perspective. 
Partnerships, of course, as you were just talking about, are so important, especially to getting to that interdisciplinary element. And just to pivot a little, federal funding and grants have been an important part of the conversation that we've had across these HBCU spotlight episodes we've been doing. So, you know, just to rope in the government into this approach to partnering in these pilots and projects, what is the role of federal support and funding at your institution? And why do you think it's important for the government to equitably allocate resources to HBCUs as a whole? We're very appreciative of all the support we receive from the federal as well as the local government to support our academic mission. I think when you think about additional resources and grants that can be afforded to HBCUs, I instantly gravitate towards the research and innovation component. We have a strong working relationship with the NIH and a, we have faculty members that work with HHS, the CDC, and other branches of the federal government from a research perspective. I think what we ha have seen most recently is a lot of the grant and funding opportunities have had an HBCU component embedded in them, which makes it a lot easier for HBCUs to compete for those levels of funding. So we're very appreciative of the acknowledgement in the role that the federal government believes HBCUs can play in addressing issues like health equity, health disparities, as well as social determinants of health that has really been amplified during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, so we believe and continue to believe HBCUs play a prominent role in terms of research, innovation, and development. And the government is really recognizing that in some of their most recent funding and grant requests for proposals. But we believe that this can continue and expand in other domains. And I think that we hopefully we will see more of that in the clinical research domain. Since we at Howard participated in the Novavax phase three clinical trial, where we were one of the sites, one of many sites throughout the country where we were giving participants an opportunity, predominantly African-Americans and communities of color, an opportunity to participate in a phase three clinical trial. And other HBCUs participated in that Novavax phase three clinical trial as well. So I think that that will continue to amplify opportunities uh, for research and funding dollars to allow each HBCU to continue to advance their research and academic yeah, speaking of growth areas that federal agencies can go into to further support HBCUs, we've seen how NIH has recently committed more to, you know, making sure that small businesses who want to compete for contracts support HBCUs or involve them, but there's certainly more that agencies can do to support HBCUs. So, what more could federal agencies be doing to support schools like yours, especially in the context of making biomedical research and health outcomes more equitable for minority researchers and people in general? Well, I think, you know, allocating more money to more equitable research and, and looking at problems that have historically confronted communities of color and medically underserved communities and we've seen a little bit of that, but I think that the dollar amounts could be larger. The length of the grants and funding could be longer to create more sustainable opportunities for extensive research within these areas. I also think that there could be more of a train-to-trainer model where we are actually participating in something very similar, where the NIH has partnered with us to increase the amount of minority researchers within the NIH realm, looking at their specific criteria and looking at opportunities where we can increase the number of researchers in that area. I think that that can be amplified. I think that we are just beginning to scratch the surface in terms of what the dollar amounts look like, but I think that those dollar amounts could be larger. And if you think about it across not only the NIH, but HHS has a significant amount of dollars that they are devoting to areas like sickle cell and 
we have a sickle cell center that can play a unique role in advancing sickle cell research. There are also opportunities now around health literacy and system literacy, where there are some funding opportunities that are specifically mention the role of HBCUs in ensuring that health literacy is culturally competent and that communities are not being left out of that discussion and materials are being developed that align with the idiosyncrasies of each of those communities. So we've seen some specific recognition and acknowledgement in these grant opportunities. I think that those opportunities can be larger, more expansive, and the FCC has recently put out some information about the digital divide. And we think that we can play a unique role in helping address some of those challenges related to the digital divide. I think that there should be some dollars there to help out in trying to understand how we can better connect communities of color to broadband and then build on that digital literacy component. So I think, in short, the answer is, I think that there could be more dollars uh, specifically earmarked for the use of HBCUs in the area of generating and cultivating a more equitable environment for communities of color. Yeah, HBCUs certainly will continue to play a bigger role in, you know, getting to equity and in achieving the efforts that, you know, we're trying to get to in fighting discrimination and um, getting to better healthcare and bridging the digital divide. So I really appreciate you joining me today. And I really hope to see Howard just continue to innovate and be in the public eye doing great things. Well, thank you so much, Melissa, for the opportunity. Um, I I really appreciate the platform to share a little bit more about the work that we're doing. and, And we continue to look forward to playing a leading role in research and innovating in new ways to help empower communities throughout the country. Of course. Thank you so much for joining me and um, good luck with all of the work that you do next. Thank you. I appreciate it. HealthCast is a production of Government CIO Media and Research. For more podcasts, head to governmentciomedia.com slash podcasts. If you liked what you heard, let us know by leaving a review in iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. HealthCast is produced by Amy Kluber, Hosted by Melissa Harris and Adam Patterson. If you're interested in sponsoring a podcast, contact us at sponsor at governmentcio.com.